Friend, I ask unanimous consent that Elizabeth Levens and David Pope, interns with my office, be granted four privileges for the remainder of today. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, I want to talk today about a subject that has immense implications for America's future. In fact, I often talk about it as being perhaps the darkest cloud hanging over the future economic well-being of our country that no one ever really talks about and has been hugely ignored. And that's the issue of retirement income and what people are going to do when they retire in the future. I've been focused on this for several years. My help committee has, over the last two or three years, had 10 hearings on this issue. We have met with a lot of the investment community and retirement benefits community uh, to take a look at what's happening and to see whether or not we can have a, a better system for retirement than what we have. Uh, right now, uh, young people who are working to pay off a student loan debt, uh, maybe buy a new home, put a little money away for their own kids' education later on, or if it's people who are close to retirement, a nurse who's been working all her life, someone who maybe worked in a small business, and they're 60 years old, and people are wondering, what are they going to do when they retire? And they're worried they won't have enough money to live on. And quite frankly, they're very right to be worried. If you uh, looked at the future and you took the working force of America today and you said, what is it that this group of people in the future will need to live on when they retire? And what they have saved for retirement. There's a deficit. They don't have enough saved to retire on. How big is that deficit? Calculations in our hearing show it's about $6.6 .6 trillion. That's a big chunk of change. That is a huge hole in the future. So when you look at what's happening, half of Americans, half of Americans have less than $10,000 in savings. As I talk and as, as, we, as we look at this, we have to remember that retirement has always been thought of as a three-legged stool. One leg is a pension, one leg is savings, and the other leg is Social Security. So what's happening now is that on the retirement pension system, the savings systems are falling down. Social Security is still strong, and I'll have more to say about that. But what we have to do is to look at how much people have in savings. Half of all Americans today working in the, that are working today have less than $10,000 in savings. Have less than $10,000 in savings. Now, uh, when I came to the Congress in the 70s, one out of every two workers had a pension. That means they had a pension that would pay them a monthly income until the day they died. And if they died, their spouse would get it. One out of every two. Today it's one in every five, and it's getting worse. Only one in five. It's fallen, by the way, this has fallen by 30% in just two decades. And again, 75 million people have no retirement plan at all. 75 million people, that, that's about half of the workforce in America, have no workplace retirement plan at all, nothing. No 401ks, no IRAs, no defined uh, benefit pr uh, program, nothing. Half, one out of every two, have nothing whatsoever. Unfortunately, instead of trying to improve the pension system, and lift everyone up. There are too many people out there trying to score political points by scapegoating public servants for state and local budget shortfalls. Pensions aren't the cause of state's fiscal problems, and retired public servants aren't living high on the hog on the taxpayer's dime. These are simply malicious myths being spread by people who I think have two objectives. One, to discredit public sector unions, and secondly, to dismantle the pension system. Pensions are one of the best ways to ensure that middle-class people can have a secure retirement. 
because they provide a guaranteed source of income that a person can count on for as long as he or she lives. Now, can the current pension system be improved? I believe so. But there's no reason to abandon a system that has worked for millions of people. The sad truth is these days, the vast majority of employees with any retirement plan of all have a 401k. Now again, I'm not here to badmouth 401ks. They can be a very good way to help people put some money aside to supplement their pension. But 401ks were never intended to replace pensions. It was to be that other leg of the stool, the savings part. Now again, we know that savings rates are too low. As I said, less than $10,000 most people have. There's no simple way also for people to convert their savings into a stream of retirement income that they can't outlive. The promise people made about 401ks was that more businesses would start them, more people would participate. Well, I was here when 401k started. Sound like a good idea? Easy way for people to, to, to save. But decades, decades after the start of 401ks, the number of workers participating in these plans has stayed flat. According to Monique Morrissey of the Economic Policy Institute, in 1989, participation in 401ks was at 46% of the workforce. 2010, it was 45%. So it's just stayed flat. Now we have seen some modest increases in savings the last few years. That's what people told me at our hearings. Well, we've seen some modest increases. I said, really? Okay, let's take a look at it. Because this kind of surprised me that we had an uptick in savings. But then we looked at the data. <laughs> and what does it show? It shows who's saving what. The top 10% income earners, the top 10% of income earners in America have 100 times more saved for retirement than the median household. So we charted it out. If you see back here in 1989, eh, they weren't too far apart. So here's the top 10%. The top 10% now have an average of $239,000 set aside for retirement. The median household, 2,500. So when you say savings have gone up, yeah, look who's saving, the top 10%. Those of us who work here, 239,000 as opposed to $2,500 for the average family. And I might just also add that buried in this, buried in this, this chart is an unacceptable amount of racial and gender inequality in this system. The National Institute on Retirement Security recently found that black, Asian, and Latino workers have significantly less access to a retirement plan on the job than white Americans, in the, especially in the private sector. As a result, the vast majority of working age households headed by people of color have little or no retirement savings. For those with a retirement plan, the average account balances for black and Latino households are less than one-fifth that of white households. So if I'm not mistaken, uh, one-fifth of $2,500 would be about 500 bucks. So buried in this, keep in mind, unequal gender and racial inequality. Addressing the issue of retirement security, again, would be particularly beneficial to women. We all know about the income gap between men and women. But what a lot of people don't realize is the gap worsens after retirement. And when you think about it, you can understand that. Uh, the, in 2011, the median annual income of older women, that is over, over retirement age, keep this in mind, the median annual income was $14,225. The median annual income of that same cohort of, early, of older men was $24,794. Now, why is that? What do you think about it? Unequal pay during their working years allows, it means women have less opportunity to save. 
They may take some time off during their working years to start a family. They have less time to save. Additionally, women tend to be concentrated in jobs that don't traditionally offer retirement plans. It's been said many times that women save more than men, save more money than men. Well, yeah, they have higher rates. But they're starting from a very <laughs> low point. So women still lag behind men when it comes to total retirement savings. So that sort of sets the stage for uh, our committee and for me to introduce the USA Retirement Funds Act. It's S-1979, if anybody wants to write down the number of the bill. It's a new retirement program. And I'm going to explain basically how it operates uh, here. It's the USA Retirement it means it's universal, it's secure and adaptable. That's what USA stands for. It would tackle the retirement crisis head on by ensuring that the 75 million people, remember my earlier chart, 75 million people without a workplace retirement plan would have the opportunity to earn a safe and secure pension. Universal, secure, adaptable. The concept is very simple. Employers who don't offer a pension or a well-designed 401k would automatically enroll their employees in this retirement fund. Now, if an employee wanted to opt out, he or she could. No one would be forced to participate. But by making the system opt out instead of opt in, we get millions more people participating. Employer and employee contributions would go into a fund that would be managed by a board of trustees. When a participant retires, the fund would provide the retiree with a mon monthly benefit as long as he or she lives, and if that person died, it would go on to their spouse. Over time, as people contribute, they would earn a real retirement benefit that will be a better bang for their buck than what they could have gotten on their own, and that's because these funds would spread retirement risk over large groups of participants. A recent report by David Madlin at the Center for American Progress found that the USA Retirement Fund, with their risk pooling and professional management, would make retirement much more affordable for working families. In fact, it would cut in half the cost that people would need, uh, it would cut in half the amount people would need to save over the present uh, system, defined contribution 401ks right now. So basically, universal access, everybody's in, you could work for an employer, three employees, four employees, two employees, you could be self-employed. Universal access. You get monthly benefits for life. You wouldn't be borrowing against it. You wouldn't be taking out a lump sum. It would be there. You get a monthly benefit for life with a spousal survival. Professionally managed. That means that it would be managed by a board of trustees who would have a fiduciary responsibility to this pool to invest it wisely. Fiduciary responsibility. That relieves the individual from trying to figure out what's the best place to put my little meager amount of savings. You know, you don't have to, you wouldn't have to, you wouldn't have to consider whether or not you should follow Uncle Fred's advice about this stock that he's got, you know, it's going to make you a lot of money in the future. Or Mr. Ponzi, what was that Ponzi guy's name again? All you had to do is give him a lot of money and or maybe Bernie Madoff in later years. No, you wouldn't have to worry about that. This would be a professional board that would have a fiduciary responsibility. And as I said, lower cost, uh, about 50%. In other words, Mr. President, what this means is that if you, were, if you were 35 years old now and working, and you figured under your 401k that you would need $2 million by the time you retired, in order to live out your life and have a decent retirement income. If you were involved in this program, uh, you would only need $1 million because the cost would be that much less. A big portion of that $2 million goes into fees during the life of that 401k. So that's the big savings here. USA Retirement, that's for the person. Now let's take a look what it means for the business. The uh, business community itself. Um, yeah, right here. 
This is the benefits to the business. It's easy to offer. You don't have to set up a plan. Small mom and pop business, if you're filling out FICA taxes anyway, you just have a separate line for this. Send it off, you have nothing else to do. You don't have to manage it. You have no risks. You have no fiduciary responsibility as an employer, none whatsoever. And you get quality benefits. Now, what this means is that a lot of employers want to make sure that their employees have a good retirement uh, benefit because as they get older, they earn more. You know, let's face it, you'd like to have people retire so you could bring younger people into the workforce. Well, if you've got people now that can't retire because they don't have enough money, they stay working. Well, if you have a good quality benefit, people get age of retirement, they say, well, I can retire now. I've got, I've got my retirement set up. And so it means for an employer, for a business, they get that kind of turnover that they need to bring in new, younger workers. And as I said earlier, it's professionally run. Uh, the company has no fiduciary responsibility whatsoever like they do under a uh, defined uh, benefit program. They don't have to manage it. They don't have to do anything. And as I said, no, no risk to the business uh, whatsoever. I would add also that under the bill, employers could voluntarily contribute to the program. They don't have to, but they could voluntarily contribute. So if, if you're signing up one of your workers at 6%, the employer could say, you know, I want to have a good workforce. I want to hire really good people, and I've got good people. I want to keep them. I'll tell you what, I'll kick in 2% or 3% or 2.5% or and kick in whatever they want as a management tool, uh, maybe even as a recruitment tool to recruit really good workers. So again, it is a, it's a good recruitment and management tool for, for the businesses. And for the economy in general, for the economy in general, uh, I think this would be good for the economy. I think this is what a lot of people don't consider. By bringing more people into this retirement system, you're going to have more savings. And you're going to have savings that are long-term type savings. It's what we call patient capital. In other words, the, the capital that comes into these big retirement pools don't need to earn, think about the quarterly bottom line, but they do think about long-term. So haven't we spent a lot of time here in this body and around the country talking about the need for infrastructure, long-term projects for this country, energy systems, electrical systems, roads, bridges, sewer, all, those, all that kind of stuff. Plus, we need long-term capital for the new entrepreneurs starting these new businesses that may take a long time for them to return some capital, but they need that access to that long-term patient capital that something like this could provide for them. And as I said, it creates a lot of jobs. Uh, Again, because of this ability to invest over long term, you're going to start creating more jobs in our country. I want to emphasize just two more key points before I yield the floor. First, the USA retirement funds would not replace pensions or 401ks. Employers could and should continue to offer these plans at the workplace. But what this would do is give people without access to a quality employer-provided plan the opportunity to earn a retirement benefit. Second point I want to make is USA Retirement Funds aren't a new government program. I, there's already been some stories written about this uh, in the paper, and someone said, Harkins, come up with a new government program. No, I haven't. This is not a government program. Uh, this is a 21st century retirement plan run entirely by the private sector, just like pensions and 401ks. Finally, I would just be remiss if I didn't talk about that third leg of the stool, and that is Social Security. Uh, we have to improve, I think, the most efficient, most effective retirement program we have, and that is Social Security. Last year, I, along with others, introduced the bill S-567, nice, easy number to remember. Uh, but it does is it expands the benefits by $65 a month. 
So that means that if you're at the lower income scale when you retire, your replacement rate will be a little bit better if you get 65 a month. For someone at the higher end, 65 bucks a month is not that big a deal. But it sure helps those at the bottom end. So it would increase that by $65. It would, in, it would index the uh, living adjustment so that you would have an improved cost of living adjustment in the future uh, because it would look at the, at the CPI uh, S, uh, the cost uh, uh, of living for elderly, and look at that and adjust it for that. And secondly, it would, uh, it would strengthen the uh, trust fund by lifting the cap on the payroll tax. You do all that, you strengthen Social Security, you actually increase the benefit a little bit, and it extends the life to 2050. So it makes Social Security stronger for future beneficiaries. So, Mr. President, by improving the retirement, the private retirement system, bolstering Social Security, we can do a number of things that take away that dark cloud. We can tell people, we can assure people that they'll be able to save and have a, a retirement benefit, an annuity, every month, for as long as they live. Secondly, we make it easier for businesses to set it up. Third, it creates jobs in our economy by long-term types of investment. So I just say that during this time of economic insecurity, it's more important than ever that working people have the opportunity to prepare for retirement. So I urge my colleagues to help rebuild the pension system in this country by supporting the USA Retirement Funds Act. Mr. President, with that, I yield the floor.